So Harry, thanks so much for coming to the show. Oh, thank you very much, David. Super excited to be here. Um, so I want to start, I always start the interviews with, with asking folks, um, what are your current research interests? What are you interested in and working on right now? Um, currently, I'm working within the open source biotechnology uh, ecosystem. I decided to use the word ecosystem because uh, I'm actually working on a number of uh, initiative research projects that, I mean, when you put all of them together, you, you would say it's, it's under the, the term open source biotechnology. Others decide to call it uh, DIY biology. Others call it uh, biohacking. Some people call it community biotechnology. I mean, people over the, the, the period have come up with a lot of names to describe the field. Uh, and I'm sure within the course of the interview, you get to know why people are coming out with lots of names just to describe this very interesting bottom-up approach of wanting to do science. Yeah, so when did you... We, yeah, that's great. So when did you come across the, the, the term or the idea first? Where was your, your introduction to it? Yeah, personally, my introduction to, to this particular term came some three years ago. That was 2017, uh, at the time when I was finishing the university uh, here in Ghana. And uh, as a young university student, I, I was so much hungry for success and wanting to uh, create impact in my community uh, and while I was a student I actively was engaged in citizen science um, I wanted to put to use the skills I was learning as a young uh, scientist so I, I was hacking experiments helping young students uh, understand those using local materials that were available to them in their communities so fast forward 2017 uh, because of how engaging I was as a young person then in my community, I had an opportunity to join uh, other like-minded Ghanaians who were promoting uh, science, STEM education, and citizen science. So in the group in which I joined, they shared an opportunity in the, uh, on the very first Global Community Bio Summit, hmm. which I didn't get the opportunity to attend for several reasons even though I happen to be the very first person globally to put in an application, which I got accepted, but I couldn't go because I was denied visa by the U.S. Embassy in Ghana. But I, that didn't actually stop me from participating effectively and engagingly in the conference. Um, I participated via teleconference where I joined in and shared the projects I was doing uh, in my community way back in the Volta region. And that was when I began hearing the buzzwords, synthetic biology, community biotechnology, open source biology, open source biotechnology. So then I took an interest in it and decided to like, just study more about what these things were, because I mean, it, it was really intriguing to me at the time, listening to the amazing projects, how people were starting uh, research labs, uh, from their garage, from their spaces, that they were even living from their kitchen. So then it really struck my mind because of the amazing research presentations they were doing out of such spaces. And then I told myself, then I, what it means is that as an individual in a, in a very disadvantaged background, I can equally leverage that as a tool to providing and solving problems in my community because I was somebody who was so very enthusiastic about doing science, but the challenges of resources, funding, were just one of the things that I was facing and couldn't do some of those things. So I, I felt that I don't, I don't require a PhD to do that research at that level. So then that was just the entry level for me. Wow, so you, so you kind of, it's interesting because my introduction to DIY biology was back in 2012, 2000 and maybe 2000, a little bit earlier, 2010. And I met a number of the people here in Silicon Valley who were starting this, this bio hacker space called BioCurious, which was yes. one of the first community bio labs. And so I met these folks 
And, you know, it was really interesting to be a part of helping them with their Kickstarter project and opening the space yeah. and just seeing the enthusiasm and the, and the excitement and the idealism. People thought yeah. this is actually a better way to do science, right? Actually yeah. involving folks in the community. And for me, I'm not a scientist, so, or not a formally trained scientist. So it was nice to be invited for once, yeah. to actually participate. And it was such a small group back then of people who yeah. were thinking like this. And it's been really cool to see the ideas um, evolve and, um, you know, make it all the way to Ghana and, and to see you kind of yeah. pick up the baton and run with it. So um, what's yeah. the, what's the, what's the, the status of, of um, DIY biology and community um, biotechnology in, in Ghana? Like wh where are you guys at? Do you, can you talk about the, the space that you've created and, and the number of people? Wh where is it? Yeah, so I would say we are still in the budding stages. We happen to be um, the very first in Ghana and uh, one of two in Africa uh, to be leading this community biotechnology, DIY bio, bio uh, revolution. And uh, I think the community is fast growing. Even people in academia begin to understand the usefulness of uh, spaces like this in uh, brewing uh, research innovations because at the moment where I'm carrying my research is from this space uh, in as much as I'm doing my research uh, I'm studying in the university for my graduate degree I'm doing almost all my research from this community uh, lab and for me that 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 is the the enthusiastic part about it because uh, people within academia even are beginning to be enthused about the kind of research that is coming out of uh, this space and won't actually want to come and see what is happening here. So for me, uh, that is the interesting th thing about this and that is where we are headed. Um, in, even though we, we are still in the bad stages, I think the, the whole euphoria and uh, enthusiasm about uh, the place of um, a non-institute or a non-academic lab can do uh, in terms of research it's, it's very interesting to say so so is it are you what kind of projects are because i remember being so surprised by the projects that were emerging at these diy biospaces i mean the ones here in california were making vegan cheese and and studying um antimicrobial properties of soil and everyone had like different ideas what kind of yeah. projects projects are are underway over there yeah so we, we actually started almost two years ago uh, working on a project called the open enzyme project uh -huh. uh, which was uh, originally started from the uk as part of the open bioeconomy lab group based in the university of cambridge uh, i would say the the huge efforts of that research group actually brought into being uh, our community lab uh, here in ghana so we have since been working on the Open Enzyme project, which is a project uh, leveraging the public domain knowledge that is coming out of biotechnology uh, patents with regards to DNA polymerases. So mm -hmm. we all DNA polymerases that have gone into uh, their patents have expired. What we have done is to create uh, an online repository of those uh, in a catalog of all those genetic parts and making them freely available to the scientific community where they could use. So what we are doing right now is we are tapping from that collection and uh, building our own genetic circuits out of those, transforming them into E. coli and brewing the E. coli and using the E. coli as cell factories for this enzyme production. And mm -hmm. that is one of the things that we have been doing uh, for the past two years. And for me, to put it into context, what I'm using it to do is, is to develop uh, a diagnostic platform to solve some pressing health challenges in terms of diagnostics in my community here in, in Ghana. So, and, and that's one of the research that I'm pushing uh, and that's what I'm studying for in the university where we want to develop a multiplex diagnostics for some bloodborne infections 
um, <clears throat> and seeing how you can just in a single tube reaction use locally produced enzymes to drive the amplifications of these targets at the molecular level without having to rely on supply chain from abroad. And we all could testify what COVID had done to, to our supply chain. Mm -hmm. So I want to overcome that challenge, uh, leveraging the powerful tool of the open enzyme collection here in Ghana and mm -hmm. uh, amplifying it and using it for molecular diagnosis and also generally helping it to, uh, using that, uh, providing these enzymes, making it available to other researchers uh, who want to use it for research or want to use it for educational purposes, because it's one of the challenges that we have where just the general lack of access to uh, research tools, particularly enzymes, have still filled how research, how education is done in our part of the country. So I want mm -hmm. to solve that problem leveraging these two. And that is one of the things we have been doing so far in terms of our projects. Oh, that's so cool. That's really exciting to, to, um, to hear about that progress. What's your, um, what's your current um, workflow look like? What, what, is your, what, are your, what kind of tools are you using at the lab to kind of make this happen? And um, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can see, you can see that I'm smiling. And, yeah. and that is because like most often than not, most of these community labs, we do not have that high throughput equipment. So one yeah. of the things that we are specialized in doing is uh, building our own hardware for some of these experiments. Right. And we have been leveraging, that is why from the beginning I mentioned that we, we leverage open source tools for some of the things that we do. And uh, we have been largely exploiting the open source hardware community documentation is available for some of this hardware where we, we, we take those, uh, those blueprints and then use them to manufacture and contextualize some of this hardware. And at the heart of some of the, the experiments we do for the enzyme production is one piece of equipment called the incubator. So we've been able to build our own DIY incubator, which is providing very good results over, over the two years we have been using that for our enzyme production works. Um, um, in terms of other stuff, we, we have tried as much as possible to frugalize almost every equipment as much mm. as possible mm -hmm. just to still get comparable results with the high throughput ones you find in the, the flashy academic labs. Um, mm -hmm. But just for, for, for a, a standard molecular biology lab, some of the things that we need, we have to, to, mm -hmm. to move those things uh, forward. We have a mini PCR um, setup that is, is also built entirely on um, the open source, the open hardware uh, principle. So that, that is how we, we are in terms of instrumentation. And that's what has been uh, anchoring the biology we have been doing so far. That's cool. Yeah, one of the projects, I, I, I know Josh and Tito, who started the original um, open PCR project. Yeah. And so yeah. it's cool to see that how that's um, evolved and you know now there's open qpcrs and and to see yeah, there, there are a number of those projects and um, i mean currently we we also built like a flow hood um out of that same uh design where it was going to be very expensive for us to get like a biological safety cabinet so yeah with my understanding of uh what it means to uh, how the principle of operation of a biological safety cabinet works. We're able yeah. to build a miniaturized version of that in the lab uh, where we had a UVC bulb in there, which is providing that microbial uh, activity by disinfecting the microbes and, and just generally keeping that workstation clean. So yeah, that, that is how we, have, we are able to translate our understanding of science into building very useful products to achieve the same purpose as the ones that are being manufactured commercially. That's cool. So you, um, were you involved in the, there was a, an event called the, the Gathering of Open Science Hardware, um, you know, that's been going on and, you know, I think it, the first one was at CERN and then it was in Shenzhen and then I, I think there was one in Africa, wasn't there? Was it in Ghana? Yes, so uh, I, I happened to participate in the Gosh gathering in Shenzhen, 
and um, also happened to be one of the first uh, participants of the first Africa uh, GOSH, yeah. where uh, I subsequently became uh, one of the co-organizers uh, oh, since cool. then. And I have been contributing to building that uh, community on the continent uh, for the past two years now. So, so tell me about that conference. Tell me about the, 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 the meeting. How many people are attending and what's, um, what's, where is it heading? Yeah, so it's, it's been a remarkable journey for us so far with regards to the Africa Open Science Hardware uh, Community and Summit. Uh, mm -hmm. It started, the journey for us started uh, in the year uh, in 2017 in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very first event saw a global representation and you'll be so much amazed. Uh, a gathering which was supposed to uh, set a pace for Africans to understand the, the general principle of open source hardware or just the whole principle of um, open science. Uh, you could see a lot of uh, actors coming just to create something for Africans. And, and for me, that was so interesting. And we saw close to uh, 150 participants for the very first time. And it has been a very interesting uh, conversation that we, we held there. Uh, in the year 2018, we equally had a similar event. In 2019, we went to Tanzania, uh, Dar es Salaam, where we equally organized uh, that gathering. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, we were supposed to head to um, Cameroon, but we are not able to do that. Uh, because of the restrictions uh, that we, we had to face. But interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, we have held uh, silo programs uh, just to keep the community engaged um, mm -hmm. and, and how the community is generally uh, gunning up to overcome the, the, the pandemic, how they are developing response solutions to, to that. And, and I think the community over, over the years has grown tremendously and one of the, the, the goals of the, the gathering is to see how we can connect the entire African continent uh, with OSH, knowing mm -hmm. that it has demonstrated uh, its usefulness in solving problems. Uh, mm -hmm. So why, why, why then can't we also leverage that uh, power of um, the open science principles to solve problems in our community? So that is what we have been doing over the, 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 the past years. And, and counting. Oh, it sounds so cool. I really want. It. I've been watching all of these, gosh, events all over the, the world, and I've. I just. It just hasn't worked out that I've been able to attend. But, you know, we've been building open source. We started building open source underwater robots, um, just because we wanted one. My friend Eric and I. We started building in his garage, and and um, we found that there were people all over the world who you know, wanted this tool and, and started building similar tools. And, you know, we've had an interesting kind of journey over the past decade of, of seeing that initial idea evolve and um, grow um, in, in a whole bunch of different forms. But um, yeah, I, it's, I think one of the things we realized is that science equipment is a really under served market um like it's it's really expensive and it just goes to a few researchers and they yeah. have high margins and the and the grants fund it all and so it's, it's there's not a big incentive to, to to stop it Ex unless there's people like us who say all right we're going to start building our own and yeah. and and then kind of keep iterating and improving it and finally more and more yeah. people get excited about it um, so that's really cool to see, and I and I'm and I hope to come visit. Um, so if we do an, another thing um, uh, as part of this interview is we do this research yeah. mode. I don't know if you saw Shannon do this, so I'd yeah, love for you to kind of share what you're working on and and give us a tour. Yeah. So uh, just hang on a minute. Oh. No problem. Yeah. So one of the tools that I personally use uh, for my research is Google Scholar most often. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it helps me to generally uh, source, source for information, um, especially 
uh, ones that are published on Google Scholar. So I use that a lot, uh, and it's been one of the tools that I've been using. I think before I, I, I even take a, a, a turn on this particular uh, part of the interview, I want to mention one of the experiences I had uh, generally uh, assessing uh, published paper when I was in the university. So in the university, I studied a bachelor's degree for medical laboratory science. Mm -hmm. And we back as part of requirements to, to complete the course, uh, you are supposed to undertake a research. So back then, I, I decided to conduct a study on the quality of life of people living with sickle cell disease. And most of the very uh, interesting papers with good results, so to say, uh, that were published in the high impact journals like Elsevier, uh, and, and, and just to mention a few, I mean, it required me to pay like some uh, bugs just to enable me to have access to those papers. And at the time, I, I mean, come from the background where I was coming from, very little uh, incentives for me uh, doing the research I was doing. I mean, it really put me off. So I got really furious. And the next thing was that I took to Twitter and then uh, did a tweet. Why was it difficult for me assessing a paper like that? So then somebody uh, came in to, to, to respond uh, to my tweets and said, yes, that, that is the, the challenge we face as researchers. And I, I just didn't understand. And, and I will say for me, that, that has been one of the inspirations for me to just get into doing the things I'm doing now. And if, if I get the opportunity to make uh, my research output widely available, I'll, I'll have a second thought whether or not some of the things that I do should be locked behind uh, payroll journals just for people to assess it because I think it it's impedes how science should generally be done because uh, there is this uh, local saying here in Ghana that no one is, is a repository of all knowledge and, and for that reason if no one is a repository of all knowledge and, and we are a connected society, somebody would house the kind of information you need to leap, uh, leapfrog you to your next uh, cre creative solution. So if, if that is the reason, then there is no need to always have uh, research outcomes mostly uh, behind paywalls. And, and for me, it really affected that research and I ended up not doing it. So, uh, but, but now, when, when I need to do any research, uh, like just one that I'm doing with regards to my, I don't know if you can see this screen now. I know uh, I can't see it. Uh, can you share it? Are you sharing it? Yeah. Hit the, hit the uh, bottom button. Yeah. So th this, this is just um, uh, an overview of my uh, literature review for my current study where I'm trying to develop a multiplex diagnostics leveraging mm -hmm. Um, uh, locally produce enzymes as polymerases for driving these reactions, right? Hmm. So uh, this document was entirely produced leveraging uh, research publications coming out from uh, journals that do not require me to pay, right? Uh, without which I wouldn't have been able to come up with this beautiful document clearly giving an insight into the need for developing this uh, diagnostic platform, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and I think this, this is the, uh, these are some of the, the benefits to making information, scientific information readily available and accessible to, the, to people and other scientists who need it because it has the, the ability to, to decide what next somebody can do. So for mm -hmm. me, this is how I, I do it. Uh, in other circumstances where I'm unable to have access to uh, good research publications uh, because of the community in which I find myself, where people post related research publications, I'm able to have access to them. I mentioned I'm part of the Open Bioeconomy Lab mm -hmm. research group. So we frequently post uh, papers that are related to the kind of works that we do. So in there, I have like on a rolling basis, 
uh, a ton of publications in the, the chosen research field in which I'm uh, professing right now. And that keeps me updated and helps me to uh, overcome these challenges because uh, these groups usually have uh, subsidized and paid uh, accounts in these high uh, journals, uh, payroll journals. So mm -hmm. people like me who do not have access, that's the, the only way we are able to have access to this. And I mean, over the years, I have uh, chanced upon SciHub, which is uh, one of the ways where uh, researchers like myself um, are able to have access to uh, very good scientific literature to advance their work. But I mean, people have their uh, own uh, views on uh, SciHub, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to go into that discussion now. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> record, but I think I think that uh, it's 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 a wonderful platform to make uh, research outputs uh, largely available. The the sides of the arguments for both people, um, I mean, are very strong ones, and which sometimes I tend to to understand. But um, I think there is a fine balance in making scientific uh, literature openly accessible for people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't incentivize people who spend uh, their time uh, researching into these things, but we can definitely think of uh, better ways of incentivizing people so that they, they feel rewarded for their hard work, um, mm -hmm. putting out these uh, beautiful works that they do. So for me, this, this is generally one of the ways that I, I go about uh, my uh, sourcing for information for advancing my research work and just generally helping me to think openly about how others have done what I'm also doing. I try, I, I most often keep a journal, which I have here. I have been oh, cool. using <laughs> this journal. It contains almost all my protocols and activities that I, I want to do. You can see like an NEB, uh, I mean, uh, chats just flipping out of the, my journal, my lab journal. And uh, I mean, I make use of other resources. Uh, the title of this is at the bench, a laboratory navigator. So this makes me, this is more like a stop, stop shot, uh, stop shop for some of the recipes that I use uh, in terms of my buffers and all that. I just check in to see how uh, things are looking like. And, cool. and because most of the things that I do are largely synthetic biology, genetic engineering, I make use of this beautiful a uh, book which was written by uh, people who also started uh, with um, started from the DIY biology uh, movement, and the title is uh, Zero to Genetic Engineering Hero. It's been a, an amazing book that takes me step by step just to gain and understand the concept of synthetic biology and genetic engineering. And it's been an amazing uh, thing so far, getting into uh, this emerging tool for conducting research because the, the, the general ecosystem around synthetic biology research in Ghana is still close to uh, new because even people in academia still do not understand what synthetic biology is, genetic engineering is. They still see it as a new and evolving uh, technology. And for me, these are some of the ways I get around it. And it's, that's how it's helping me so far in the research that I'm doing. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, and so you, do you, so you write your drafts on, on Google Docs and you invite other folks to edit there and kind of do kind of collaborative work there too? Yes, that is correct. So this document that I'm sharing currently with you, it's, it's, it's an open uh, document which I collaborate with together with my supervisors and, and my uh, funders from the UK. So uh, this is how we, we work on most of my documents together. Um, cool. And I use this not only for my research purposes, or, but also for other works that uh, require some collaborative uh, power and collective intelligence to uh, churn out something that is more uh, stronger. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think this um, it's, it comes up very often in these interviews is people are writing papers on Google Docs collaboratively. And I do it too, so I understand it. But it's, it's interesting how that um, has grown into 
to becoming one of these powerful these powerful tools for doing science right in collaboration so that's cool yeah well, one of the other things that sorry just to uh just add on this one of the other yeah. things that um, have been so helpful to me over the course of the period is um a scientific uh, network called reclone um which i will just share uh, i'll stop sharing this and share the reclone okay Right. So this this is the Reclone. Uh, so the Region Collaboration Network. Uh, it, it started during the the COVID era, where we generally wanted to make uh, researchers come together, communicate among themselves, uh, make protocols easily accessible. Because one of the things that can affect how a researcher works or a scientist works is access to. Um, information and protocols, right? So mm -hmm. how even what, what you can have a protocol, but it, it can be, be really challenging uh, replicating that uh, protocol. And one of the, the tenets of science is reproducibility. So, mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, one of the, the things that I read uh, not too long ago, uh, the seven biggest challenges uh, of science. And one of the things that they pointed out in there, I think uh, from Vox, one of the things they pointed out in there is that uh, most scientists are unable to replicate the works of other scientists. And the reasons are that uh, their experimental designs are not too clear, their methodologies are not too clear enough. And these methodologies all uh, are what we sum as the uh protocols so this network came together during the COVID era to share protocols that were related to COVID. however hmm. they also engage uh, other scientists to give them better understanding into some of these protocols and how to get away with some of the challenges that they are having and for me i see this as a very useful platform that is, is going to that is helping to achieve one of the tenets of uh, of science which is re reproducibility because mm -hmm. it helps other scientists overcome that challenge and for mm -hmm. me i find this too very useful and I, I, it equally has been saving me so well over the period um, so you yeah. so you think it'll grow so something grow that's be, also worth, uh, mentioning. cool and you think it'll be it'll continue to grow after covid yeah yeah, cool. Because uh, there they have been calls for uh, how to grow uh, local production systems to to mm -hmm. augment the the already uh, global supply chain challenges that we have, right? So cool. for people like me in a very low resource context, uh, these platforms become still useful, and not only for me, but to to the, to the wider scientific community where. That yeah. communication among scientists, bouncing of ideas, and and just coming up with best uh, hacks to overcome challenges is still useful. This platform will still serve that need, and and I think uh, it has come to stay. Okay, cool. Sounds great. You've you've shared a lot of of really like interesting ideas and compelling ideas, and I I always ask the the last one is what are you, what are your what do you think the most important ideas are for making um, science better? Um, so for me, I think uh, creating a more inclusive uh, system around science is one way of making science better. And what I mean by uh, creating a more inclusive system is uh, cuts across a number of uh, areas. One of is um, how do we create better funding systems? Because uh, how we fund research generally determines how people can act and engage in science. Hmm. Uh, and, and I speak uh, from a personal experience and also from experiences of other researchers in um, the parts of the country or the parts of the world in which I'm coming from, where most researches that are done here are largely uh, funded ones and the research aims are largely detected by funders. So we scientists generally do not have uh, to determine their own research agenda when it comes to our part of the world. So it is affecting the general um, inclusion 
in, 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 in the outcomes that comes out of this research. So if you're able to come up with better, and I think this can, can, can happen from either a top-down or a bottom-up approach of how we can streamline how funding is generally uh, given to science and scientists or researchers in, in our parts of the world, and not generally in Africa, but even the global south, because their uh, situations is quite comparable to uh, how African researchers uh, do science. And, and I think this has, for over the years, uh, created some level of um, yearning gap in terms of uh, inclusion and how science outputs is coming out of the, the African continent. The other has to do with um, representation in terms of female representation. How do we create a more uh, compelling incentives for uh, female participation in science, right? If you're able to uh, provide solutions to this, I think we are on, on, on the, the road to making science better and overcoming the, the challenges that we see. Because one of the, the tenets of open science is inclusion. And if, if you look closely at the, the entire um, understanding or principle of openness, it looks at uh, inclusion, which helps to overcome some of the barriers that we, we, we face today in science. So for me, I think largely looking at inclusion uh, from the funding point of view and how we can generally uh, rope in the, um, the, 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 the larger minorities um, females and also underrepresented communities who generally make science uh, better uh, moving forward. I love that. I, I totally agree. Um, you know, one of the projects I'm involved with um, is experiment.com, which yeah. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of it, but it's a, it's a crowdfunding website for science. And it's interesting yeah. because um, the, all the data they have show that women and early career researchers actually do much better on the platform, which is really exciting um, because that's of course the opposite of what happens in kind of a traditional, in the kind of yeah. traditional funding scheme. But one of the things that is, is so cool about experiment is they just tried to do something different, right? right. Like, okay, it's, it's like a small experiment into something new. So when you think about like, um, this is just kind of like a brainstorming session, I think, but what would you, like what, what kind of funding mechanisms would you like to see? I mean, is it more, more peer reviewed grants um, or is there any other ideas you'd like to see implemented or tried? Yeah, so I, I want to see a more decentralized peer review uh, funding mechanism to mm -hmm. answer the how to answer how funding is given to people who want to do research. And I saw a beautiful thing that was done uh, within this COVID era. I don't know if you've heard of the just giant, just just one giant lab juggle, mm -hmm. which is um, an open source uh, community, virtual uh, open source community for uh, people who want to solve the SDGs uh, using open science. Mm -hmm. And they did something really, really brilliant. And that, that, that was the harness, the, 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 the collective intelligence of, of the open source community on Jugo to uh, vet proposals that were submitted, hmm. right? So there wasn't any jury. They, they, they leveraged the, the communal power of assessing this and that determine whether these initiatives can be uh, supported or not through their mini grants. And mm -hmm. in situations or circumstances where they knew that proposals that were submitted had a potential to uh, providing a sustainable solution, but wasn't presented well, they got back to those um, people who submitted these grants uh, or proposals and ask them to uh, look at a, a, a particular portions of the proposal they submitted. And these comments that came from this crowdsource community made these proposals better. And for me, yeah. I think that way of supporting 
uh, research is it's so, 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 so amazing. And I, I would love to see that way of supporting research happen and not just because of the, the COVID uh, situation. And the turnaround time was so fast uh, that people were able to get feedback in time to decide the next steps of their research. And that mm. is one of the things that I, I, I think we, we should begin to learn from because the open science community has a lot to, to teach the, the traditional system mm. of, of doing this in, in particular, even funding, and which I think has been demonstrated already. So the, so the, the idea, if I'm hearing you kind of correctly, is, yeah. um, a, well, it's a, there's a few aspects to it, but one aspect is, you know, we have open science where we have open results and hopefully open data and, and yeah. you know, op open code. But what you're saying is it might be helpful to go up upstream and actually open up the proposals um, yeah. so that, that those are shared publicly um, and have the ability to get feedback or collaborators um, and different, is that, so is that the idea? Yeah, I like that idea. idea. One of the things that's I learned with, one of the things I learned with experiment that I think is actually really important, and what I what I hear in your in your uh, explanation as well, is the idea of separating the um, the scientific validity and then the ranking for who should get the funding, right? Like Great. that's what the traditional peer review process does is it has a, a small group of people who rank these things and that determines who gets funded. But if you yeah. separate these two concepts, like one is let's just make it a good scientific question and proposal. Yeah. And then let's decide who gets the funding, make that a separate decision. That opens up all sorts of creative possibilities for rethinking how it gets done, right? Because if you know that there's a bunch of, because um, if you know you have a filter for everything in here is going, has some scientific validity um, and rigor, uh, you know, then we can do, like one of the things we're doing now is proportional prizes. So giving out uh, yeah. portions of a grant to people based on how many backers they have and trying to incentivize them to communicate with their community. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch of really interesting ideas that we could, um, test out unfortunately i don't you know people are so hesitant to try new things the Definitely. funders are, are very conservative uh in terms yeah. of how they want to get the funding out um so I, I i do i i'm with you i hope we see um some more adventurous funders right because yeah. like you said they do they are dictating a lot of the research agenda and I think for a lot of them, they don't necessarily want to. They'd actually like to see more creativity uh, and more kind of people pursue the questions that are that are important to them and to their communities. So I agree. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, that's, that's really true. And, and good things happen if science actually is taken out of the bench to the public. So I think that is one of the things we, we need to be, to be looking out for. Uh, and uh, for me, I, I wouldn't want to just finish my research and it is lying in, in, in the lab. I want to see it impact the lives of people. And, and, and I think that is the greater goal of science. And I, I want to employ all scientists out there to always stay conscious that the scientific process doesn't end if their research is still in the lab. It needs to get out of the lab. That is when the research process is entirely exhausted. Right. So that, that's one of the things that I, I want to leave with the, the, the general scientific community. I know people who listen to this uh, interview, and uh, I think we, we need to, as scientists, need to uh, have that um, uh, greater incentive that until the public sees uh, the research that we do and are able to relate with it, our work is not complete. That is one of the things we need to always get towards. I agree. I like it. Well, uh, Harry, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed the kind of tour of how you work and, and talking to you. And um, two things I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to following along and, and seeing uh, seeing more about your work and, and hopefully um, attending one of these, gosh, 
meetings and, yeah. and getting getting to meet you and see I'll your lab. I'll so. send an invitation to you and uh, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Shannon, all right, well, Shannon, Shannon has been Shannon has been to almost all the the Africa Gosh events that we've organized, right from Ghana through to Tanzania. So we we have interacted and met on those uh, occasions, and she, she's been an amazing mentor and, and friend so far. I, she's such a great champion for um, for um, really truly open community based yeah. public science. It's she's she's yeah. great. So. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you.